Welcome to The Lex Factor, a lawfully good podcast where we'll brief you on the business of law so you can build a better practice and capture more billable hours. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Lex Factor. It's your host, Lauren, here. It's weird I wait on Brad to introduce himself, and he's not here right now. Brad will be joining us, everybody, later on in this episode, but you're stuck with me right now. Um, And I'm actually here with Peter Giuliani. Um, You guys heard him before. He's back on the show. Welcome back, Peter. Hi. Thank you for having me back. Of course. It was such a good first impression, you know? (laughs) All right. So for those who weren't able to tune in the first time you were on the show, why don't you give our listeners just a little background on yourself and what you do for a living? Okay. I'm a law firm management consultant and have been so for far too many years. <laughs> <laughs> I started my consulting career at Price Waterhouse in New York in 1968. And my first law firm consulting assignment was 1969. Been sort of doing it pretty much ever since, off and on, doing also uh, expert testimony uh, in certain damage matters and so forth when, oh, wow. uh, along the way as well. I am a, by education, managerial econom- economist and or economics person. <laughs> uh, I passed the CPA exam in 1974 <laughs> and couldn't pass it today. If I tried. <laughs> yeah, economics was a tough one for me. Not Obviously, I did not do yeah. that, but even economics in college, that was a tough course. Uh, after doing a 20-year stint in the uh, big eight accounting firms, been doing uh, consulting with smaller law firm consulting operations. I took seven years out uh, to actually have a real job where <laughs> I was the business manager for a 200-lawyer firm here in Connecticut. Oh, okay. And then we reorganized the firm from 200 lawyers down to a 60-lawyer oh, wow. trust, sta- trust and estate boutique. Uh, which That's was their, their strong their strong suit. I organized reorganized myself out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> Purposely, and, <laughs> no. and so my my succession plan was to hang out my consulting shingle again. <laughs> so that that's how I got to where I am. My clientele over the course of the years has gradually migrated from fairly large law firms now to where. The bulk of my work is with firms of 25 lawyers or fewer, Yeah, which is where within that group of firms, succession planning has become a major issue. Yeah, that's where the Because these are needed. firms that were all either broke off from larger firms or were formed a number of years ago and have grown to a decent size. 25 lawyers is a pretty good size yeah. firm. Considering I think the average size law firm in the United States is somewhere around three lawyers. Yeah. Uh, Small is definitely the majority. Yeah, they're all the people who founded these firms are all getting on in age and they're getting ready to retire. So uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in how do we move on from the either the founding generation to the first generation non-founders, yeah. or how do we set up something where we don't have to have this existential crisis every time somebody <laughs> retires. Yeah. Yeah, and I think having someone with a, a background like your own is really invaluable in situations like this because, I mean, we joke about it all the time, but in all reality, in law school, you you learn nothing about running a business, about running a law firm. So, you know, succession, marketing, revenue, all that, it's not yeah. their strong suits for the most part. So right. um, you wrote an article, what I want to talk about today, or actually not an article, an open letter, um, Seven <laughs> Deadly Sins of Succession Planning, an open letter to first generation partners. So before we actually dig into that, what was what was your inspiration? What were your thoughts and goals behind penning this? Okay. I had prior to that written a book for the ABA entitled Passing the Torch Without Getting Burned, <laughs> which was a, a, a book on sort of like the mechanical and financial aspects of ownership transition. Mm-hmm. It really dealt with a lot of the economics of it. I then said, you know, there's more to this than just the economic stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff that's tied up in emotions and human relationships and all this other stuff. So how do I put something out there that works some of these other human elements into succession planning? The way I like to write is through almost like parables that illustrate points 
through case studies. Mm -hmm. So the book, the Passing the Torch, has got a lot of case study stuff in there. So I figured I, I would take two firms that I had worked with over the years, one that I thought had done an extraordinary job of succession planning, and one that I thought had done a horrible job at it. <laughs> and disguise disguise the names and the identities. Of course, kind of, of stuff. course. Okay. Sort of try to illustrate what went right in one firm and what went wrong in the other firm and use them as to contrast each other. So that's what the article does. Uh, you'll be amused to learn that I did get a telephone call from one firm one time. <laughs> he said, I just, I just read your article, oh, on Seven Deadly Sins of Succession Planning. He said, and um, I've committed eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought they were going to yell at you for using them as the case. No, no, study. no, no, no. no. <laughs> Good thing. Hey, at least, you know, you're helping somebody, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, That's I, hilarious. I, 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 the, probably I would say 50% of my active consulting assignments now have something to do with succession. Even those that are involving mergers of law firms. Mm. Because in many cases, the purpose of the merger is succession planning. Yeah. Um, before we dig into actually your seven deadly sins, bad news, Brad is not going to be able to make it. Um, so you guys are all stuck with me right now, especially you, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's all my pleasure, dear. <laughs> Perfect. So let's talk about these seven deadly sins. Uh, one, failure to create a culture of legacy as opposed to a culture of individualism. A very wise managing partner, a lady from a law firm in the uh, maritime provinces in Canada, we were, we were talking and she says, I always think of uh, the three most important pronouns in a law firm, the I, the we, and the it. The I refers to the individual partner. Mm -hmm. The we refers to the collective group of today's current owners. And the it refers to the institution that is the law firm itself. And if you build a culture in the firm where people are constantly trying to improve the fate and longevity of the institution, as opposed to their particular competitive position within the institution. Exactly. Yep. If you've got the team focused on, uh, as a friend of mine says, get all the wood lined up behind one arrowhead. And if that's what people are focusing on, then succession planning becomes fairly easy because what you're trying to do is improve the, the longevity and the life of the entity. Yeah. As opposed to necessarily having to pedal the bike bicycle faster <laughs> as you get older. Yeah. And I can see why that is definitely one of the sins, because regardless of the industry, people, are, unfortunately, they're in it for themselves. They want to prove themselves. They want to get a promotion. They want to get a raise. They're fighting to become a partner. Um, so at the end of the day, yes, your success is helping the company, but they're not thinking about it in that way. Right. You know what I mean? Um, right. So your second sin, failure to create and nurture the next generation of owners. I know we talked a little bit about this in our last episode with you, yeah. um, but it's probably one of the biggest mistakes that's happening out there. Yes, because uh, anybody who is not an owner is viewed as uh, somebody who should be kept in the dark. Mm -hmm. And you don't share information about anything with this unless you're complaining about somebody else in the partnership. Yeah. What you have to do is you can't do succession planning if the next generation isn't ready. So you have to keep focusing on the next generation. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep making sure that they are glued into key relationships with clients so that if anything happens to you, uh, you've got somebody to cover your back. Access to the information, the data, the clients, all of it. Right. You know, uh, even in some very small firms, I have seen where part of that function is performed by paralegals. And this is true, particularly in in uh, firms that do a lot of estate planning and in some cases, a lot of personal injury. And Because the first contact you make with the firm, many cases, is non-lawyer. It's a it's a, an intake paralegal. Yeah, exactly. Or, or a receptionist the, or yeah. Yeah, but if you're also if you're also dealing with estate planning for people, uh, okay, sure, the lawyer is going to be the face to the client and so forth. But eventually, the people who are doing most of the work and know as much about the relationship as the partner can be the associate or the the uh, a paralegal. One client did a, a very interesting thing, which is they sort of organized their estate planning lawyers into teams. 
And in every team, there is a, a partner, an associate, a paralegal, and a secretary or administrative assistant. Mm-hmm. And they make it very important that the clients, particularly the, those with large estates, get to know everybody on the team. So that if they have a question, they don't always have to call the partner. Yeah, I love that. They call it, they call sooner or later, they're going to find that, you know, they get billed less if they call the paralegal. <laughs> exactly. And um, there's multiple uh, benefits here. <laughs> right. But they've actually, they've actually printed up business cards. Yeah. Where, you know, everybody has a business card, you know, on the, the Giuliani team. And, and uh, okay. all the team members' names are on that card. So, and their telephone numbers are on that card. Hmm. You're never not going to be able to contact the firm. I love that. And I think not only does it help with training succession, um, but we here at Lexicon, we talk a lot about taking that client-centric approach too. And so yeah. it helps there because the client knows that they are always taken care of, that no matter who they ask or what question they have, it's not going to take 24 hours for them to get an answer, um, mm-hmm. especially if they're working on a, a pretty sensitive case. You know, say someone's getting a divorce or working through some estate planning issues. It's nice to know that you can get an answer um, almost immediately. I love that. And that kind of leads us into the next. I know we talked a little bit about this as well in the prior episode, but another sin of yours is just failing to address succession until it's too late. Um, and I know I ask you, when do you when do you even start? You know, when is the right time? But on the flip side, how do you know it's too late that you've waited too long to put your succession plan into place? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Besides when something bad happens. Well, you know, you know, you've waited too long when uh, a partner passes away. Yeah, and you don't have any plan. Then it hits you right smack dab in the middle of your forehead. You know. You also know you've waited too long when the client comes to the firm and says, "I really like the work that so and so is doing for me, and I've been giving you all this work for all these years, but I don't see any. I want to. I want to. Who's next? Yeah." You know, who's, what's the next generation look like? And uh, I think we talked about last time, instances I'm seeing now where clients are taking a much more active role in demanding that law firms have succession plans. You know you, you've you waited too long if your clients are the ones that are yeah. pushing that. Because those are the last people I would expect to notice or ask right. about something like that, right. especially right. if you're, you know, a smaller or solo law firm and maybe you're just doing mm-hmm. like family work, criminal work, something like that. I can expect it a little more when it's, you know, maybe a larger firm and maybe they're doing some corporate work or business, you know, something like that. You would maybe expect that a little more frequently. So, yeah, I can definitely mm-hmm. get that. If your client is asking, then <laughs> yeah, probably the client, too late. If the client's bringing up the subject, you've waited too long. Yeah. What you want to be able to do is be able to go to the client and say, hey, let's go out to lunch. There's a young, young kid in my firm I'd like to have you be. Yeah. You know, you, you have lunch with a client and, and everybody gets very comfortable talking about all sorts of things together. Yeah. You know, and it's not necessarily succession planning that you're talking about. It's what you're talking about is issues important to the client, Mm -hmm. but the the young person is making good points and scoring good points with the client. Yeah. So they feel comfortable. And shows that they understand the client's business and all that. Exactly. Exactly. And that's something to nice that's due in the beginning of the case as well. Obviously, if you don't get to it until later on in the case or you have a new hire and bring them on. But um, there's something about doing that from the beginning when you're laying out the expectations of the case and the process with your client and what things are going to be like to have that set, to have the team members that are going to be assisting from the get go and be able to introduce them. It really does help with that client experience as well. Yeah, there there, there used to be this old expression you heard. Clients don't don't hire law firms, they hire lawyers. <laughs> and I think that's absolute nonsense. Clients do not hire lawyers, they hire teams of lawyers. Hmm. If your team does not have breadth and depth strength and bench strength, clients are not going to give you terribly complicated things to do. Yeah. Unless, you know, you're, you're a personal injury lawyer who gets a lot of your client stuff from TV advertising and that kind of stuff. That's a different kind of practice. That's a, a yeah. I was going to say on the flip side, I can see you go and have that initial consultation. It's a small firm. They don't have the team in place. They don't have the succession plan in place. So it is like you are, you're, you're, 
buying that lawyer. You're not buying the firm. You're not buying the team. You're buying who you're having that interaction with. But in an ideal world, you are. You're buying that team. You you need to rely on the team because the lawyer can't do it all by him him or herself. Another thing you talk to is the failure to clarify the meaning of equity. Um, Explain that one. Why is that a sin? There's this notion uh, that you see that kind of has been perpetrated starting at the very large law firms where, you know, you stay around long enough and you keep your nose clean (laughs) and you do good work for the institutional clients of the firm. And eventually you get to be a partner. You get made partner. Mm -hmm. So making partner is important, but nobody understands what making partner is. (laughs) You know, making partner. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a title. However, Along with it, not it doesn't. It's not true anymore. But it used to mean that you were jointly and severally liable with all of your other partners for malpractice cases, issues, yeah. um, and commercial stuff. You definitely don't think of that side of it as much. You know, people no. make partner and it's this big celebration, but then you're on the hook too. Yeah, I, yeah, because <laughs> then you have to co-sign the uh, uh, as a guarantor on the note uh, with the bank. Mm-hmm. You, in some cases, have to accept some liability under the lease. Uh, you know, you're, you've, you've become a co-owner of a business. Yeah. And that's very different than being an employee of the business. Especially when there's multiple co-owners. You know, right. it's not just you and you and your boss, you and the founder of the firm. There could be seven, ten other partners there. Right. All of whom have a responsibility to the entity because they are, they have a fiduciary responsibility to the health of the entity. Mm-hmm. That's the real big difference, and it's what yeah. a lot of law firms don't really do too well in terms of coaching young people yeah. as to what it means to become a partner. Well, and especially if you don't have any experience, and it's it's scary. I mean, think about think about this not being a law firm and you going into business yeah. with seven other people that you've worked with before, but you don't really know too well. That's that's scary. Yes, interest. You, you're putting all your trust in those people. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny because as you mentioned that because years ago there was a guy, uh, Royal Victor, who was the chairman of Cravath, Swain, and Moore. He was a presiding partner. That was his title. Mm-hmm. And he explained to me one time why a law firm could never be larger than 100 lawyers. He says, because you have, I mean, in those days, Cravath, as they still do, have roughly three associates per partner. And uh, he said, you can't intimately know all of your partners and their families if that group is larger than 25 lawyers or 25 people. That's about the limit that you could possibly yeah, and that's a lot. Get to know well enough. That's a lot. Yeah, and since you have to have three associates per partner, that's your hundred lawyers. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, Cravath never broke the hundred mark. Oh wow! <laughs> it only started to break down when limited liability structures came into play. Yeah, because their law firms then didn't have to be so extremely careful about the the quality of the people that they, not the saying that they admitted bad people as partners. Yeah, 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 but yeah. yeah. <laughs> they admitted a lot more people as partners. So the next on your list, it was failure to encourage entrepreneurship. So that's yeah. another sin of yours. Um, yeah. Kind of, and I guess in a way, this kind of ties into the the next one, number six too, failure to let go and, and trust others. You know, in a way that's mm-hmm. part of being an entrepreneur. Right. And encouraging people not to just sit in the office and do legal work yeah. uh, to develop relationships with clients. And if you're dealing with larger corporations and that sort of stuff, okay, the senior partner on the client relationship uh, may very well be a very close friend and acquaintance, et cetera, of either the general counsel or of the chairman of the, or the, president of the company or the family that owns the business, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are younger people in in every organization. You you should be encouraging your younger lawyers in your firm to develop relationships with their counterparts and their peers in their clients' organizations. So it means just getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Spending some time, do a little outreach, uh, you know, take them to lunch or exactly. whatever. Do that to build relationships and trust. And that's part of entrepreneurship. Yeah. 
And that's one of the things I think a lot of people overlook too. They they underestimate the value of building that network and building those connections. Obviously here we're talking too about letting go and you know one of the best ways for you to learn is to get you know thrown to the wolves and do it yourselves, but obviously too on, on like we were mentioning earlier, building that network, building those relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there may come a time where you need some help. And if you've been good about building those relationships, you always have somebody that you can go to for, yeah. you know, their assistance, advice, whatever, maybe for them to introduce you to somebody um, in return. But there's just so many benefits, you know, to to pushing people and letting them go. Like I said, not only are they learning by, by trial, um, but they're mm. building that network that they're going to be able to rely on for the rest of their careers. That requires two things to be happening at the same time. One is the partner has to have enough self-confidence and guts. That's a good point, yeah. To to entrust a relationship with younger people. Yeah. Well, they don't want them to mess up what they've they've built, but they also there could be a sense of competition there. Yes, and you, you what you want to do is be as open in terms of communicating and you don't have to do it with everybody. You just have to do it if, let's say, if I'm a partner in a law firm. I don't have to do that with everybody, but I sure as heck ought to be doing it with the two or three associates that are working on matters yeah, for me. Yeah, exactly. And, and spending a little extra time, not billing the client for it, but spending a little extra time explaining the business aspects of the client's business so that the kids coming up are getting an education on not only the law practice, but they're getting an education on what makes their clients tick. Yeah. And I think that that leads really well into your last sin. It's talking about that next generation, the the younger generation, and not educating them on the firm's finances and the economic realities. That's part of it too. You know, they need to learn how to practice law. They need to learn about the clients. They need to learn about that, that firm's culture and their mission and operations, but the finances too. And that's something yeah. a lot of firms and companies in general, don't like to be as open about. Yes. And the best associate candidate for partner is, I think, somebody who has actually had to make a payroll. <laughs> and if you've never in your life had to make a payroll and actually you know, have enough money in the bank to pay your employees, yeah. I've seen this a lot in some more successful uh, associates in firms who grew up in families that had closely held businesses. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about restaurants, laundries, fuel oil distributorships, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you want to understand how the basic business structure works and have had dinner table conversations with your parents about uh, things that are going on in in, in the family business, Mm -hmm. you'll you'll understand the law firm stuff or you'll understand the the workings of a law firm a lot quicker than you would if all you've done is just treated studying law as an academic exercise. Yeah. Sure, you know all the legal issues and you could spot all that stuff, but you have to be able also to spot the financial issues. Yeah. And and you have to be able to do it for your own firm as well as to do it for your clients' firms. Growing up, both my parents own their own business. And so mm. um, obviously when I was younger, you don't understand a lot of it. But, you know, my mom had a store that was open for almost 35 years. So it basically spanned my whole life. And it was yeah. interesting the older I got to see the struggles that she would have, especially once like the age of the internet came and there was so much competition, people were shopping online. Um, mm-hmm. And for her to have been doing that her whole life, you know, she was in her 60s at that point in time, it's a lot harder to adapt. So while it's it's not apples to apples here, it's, it's similar for the, the legal industry. You know what I mean? We talked earlier mm-hmm. about how it's a buyer's market. If the firm isn't operating in a way that the client wants, they'll go online, they'll find a different firm. You know what I mean? It's that easy. And then you have people that have been, you know, solo law firms, small law firms that have been running their own firm for decades. Um, And it's harder to adapt. You know, they're not necessarily doing the marketing. They're not building a firm that is as prime or desirable for succession, um, especially if they are starting that planning too late. Now, some of the good things that happen to the older lawyers, too, the more you cultivate and develop younger lawyers in the firm, the more likely it is they will push you out of your comfort zone. Yeah, true. And push you to go beyond what you feel you know, you're, you're learning too. Yeah. You just have to be open to it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I go back to those people who are open to it and who support that within the culture of the firm, 
are the ones that are going to have the easier time on succession plan. Totally agree. Well, Peter, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure. I learned a lot as always. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate having the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Lex Factor. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Lex Factor. Lexicon takes care of business so you can take care of law. Learn how to build a better practice at lexiconservices.com.